I V M. Yuddha is for adults. It contains graphic depictions of violence against humans and animals. If you feel you'll be triggered by the accounts of violence in this podcast, it's best you skip through those bits. That said, on to the episode. Welcome back to Yuddha, the Indian military history podcast. I am Anirudh Kanesetti and I am Aditya Ramanathan. It's been an eventful few months, folks, to say the least. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to some of the greatest socio-economic displacements that the Indian subcontinent has seen since partition. Heart-rending visuals from across the world have driven home the fragility of human life within our Kafkaesque bureaucratic and political systems. But it's also driven home the ability of our species to persevere, to struggle, and to save each other against all odds. Aditya and I have daytime jobs as geopolitics researchers, so we've been busy with a ton of work aiming to understand how the pandemic is impacting and will continue to impact the world in years to come. But now we have a little more free time, and so we're back to moonlighting once again as amateur historians. Join us as we return to a time when another terrible pandemic, the bubonic plague, ravaged the world. a time of shattering shields and bloody swords screaming horses and trumpeting elephants a world totally different from ours and yet inhabited by people just as complex as we are once again we will see how their avarice and determination their dilemmas and their misfortunes led to the world that we inhabit today in the last couple of episodes of yuddha an ambitious rapacious bunch of warlords from central asia managed to defeat against all odds the powerful war like kingdoms of northern india including the chahamanas the gahadwalas the chandelas and the palas over the course of the 11th and 12th centuries we saw the rise and fall of the ghaznavids and how they used elephants and coinage to formulate a dynamic if ephemeral vision of kingship over northwest indian afghanistan and we saw how they were defeated by the ambitious ghurids who burned their city to the ground we watched as the slave soldiers of the ghurids unleashed wave after wave of brutal horse riding raiders into the gangetic plains until eventually being beaten back from eastern india finally we saw some of these soldiers embark on ambitious military and construction programs in many minor strongholds engaging in a power struggle against each other until the most powerful of them eventually settled down to create a new state in this foreign land a new sultanate the sultanate of delhi but what we didn't see as we observed this political and military turbulence in northern india was the unfolding of other momentous events in the rest of the world in southern india we last saw the savage wars of the chalukyas of the deccan and the choras of the tamil country and discussed how the choras attacked north india and indonesia roughly the same time as mahmud of ghazni in the early 11th century today barely 2 centuries later the warrior slave turned sultan iltutmish canters around meroli in modern delhi while the choras in the deep south are in the process of collapsing Many vibrant new states are emerging in the Deccan and in the Tamil country the Seona Yadavas the Kakatiyas the Hoysalas and the Pandyas it will not be long before they too must reckon with the ambitions of the sultanate but that is still a far away and distant dream for Iltutmish and his rambunctious turkic military aristocracy because a great tsunami of blood and destruction has been unleashed upon the world the mongols under the banner of genghis khan one of the most transformative humans to ever live as consequential a life as buddha jesus cyrus the first and the prophet muhammad as iltutmish's horse snorted and its hooves splattered in the mud of meroli thousands upon thousands of mongol cavalry archers engulfed the great plains beyond the oxus river where many of his slave soldiers and perhaps he himself had been born this new horde is rampaging out of central asia into west and east asia innovative ruthless led by commanders of such military brilliance that there seems to be nothing that can stop them the mighty civilizations of china and persia with populations numbering in the millions inhabiting thriving cities and manning imposing strongholds will soon be swept away should this horde reach india they will destroy this fledgling sultanate as they have so many others and off to delhi south east and west 
the warlords of India still threatened to wipe out that tiny city. But as we all know, they didn't. It was Delhi whose elephants and war horses would instead rampage over the rest of the subcontinent, trample the corpses of Mongols, sack the ancient palaces and temples of the deep south of India. But how did all that happen? How did these sultans of Delhi manage to turn back these deadly, world-ending threats that threatened the grip over North India that they had secured only a few decades ago? How did they, in the process, become Indian and introduce new economic and political forces into the subcontinent? Over the course of this episode, which is the first half of a two-part series on the improbable rise of the Delhi Sultanate, we'll follow the turbulent geopolitics of Central Asia and Northwestern India. We'll watch as the Sultans build on the intricate systems of fortifications that were once used by the former rulers of Northern India to keep them at bay. We'll see how, against all the odds, the Sultans Balban and Alauddin Khilji defeated the Mongols, one of the most astounding but most neglected upsets in global military history. And we'll see how they developed the tactics and power that would lead tiny Delhi to ascendancy over all the rich and militaristic kingdoms of the Indian subcontinent. But first, let's talk about the Mongols. A people never before united until the rise of a young man called Temujin. Of course, the world now knows him as Chinggis or Genghis Khan, the Khan of the Sea of Grass. Genghis Khan was really a product of both his time and his place. We've talked about the Turks before, how these people from the steppes of Central Asia were hardy nomads and horse-born warriors. In that respect, the Mongols were like the Turks, but really dialed up all the way to Levin. They came from the Mongolian plateau, which is largely walled off from the rest of the steppe. I actually like to think of it as being the citadel of Inner Asia. You have the Altai Mountains to the west, the Khingan Mountains to the east, due north are the frozen wastes of Siberia, and to the south is the Gobi Desert. Protected from the outside world, even from the rest of the steppe, this was the broad area from which other famed nomads had also emerged in the past, the Huns and the Turks. And the Mongols were the last of these great eruptions, and they would be the most ferocious of them all. In this land of vast expanses, of cloudless blue skies and freezing winds, the Mongols were only one of many tribes. Like other tribes of the steppe through the centuries, they remained glued to their horses, they herded sheep, they heaved baggage onto the sturdy backs of their Bactrian camels. They also went to war with neighboring tribes, each warrior taking four or five horses with him as he went into battle. It was in the late 12th century that the Mongols were united by this man, Temujin or Chinggis Khan. And this man would bring them together under a common Mongol identity and a common law code called the Yasa. And by this time, Chinggis Khan wielded a superbly disciplined army. In this army, you rose through the ranks in what was really a ruthlessly meritocratic system. If you did something as stupid as disobeying orders, you would find your life expectancy drastically shortened. It's kind of surprising to think of the sheer success that this meritocratic military machine achieved within just a few decades of Chinggis Khan's declaration as the Khan of the Sea of Grass, essentially the leader of this quote-unquote Mongol nation. If you look at every army today, you will see that professional standing armies are always ruthlessly meritocratic. There is a lot of emphasis on identifying and nurturing military talent. That's something that was really a part of the most successful ancient and medieval armies. Uh, it's something that was, for example, really encouraged by the Romans. It was really encouraged by the Macedonians. And of course, it was also really encouraged by Chinggis Khan. This is quite a, a stark contrast to, for example, how warfare was done in India, where um, the higher ranks of the military machine were always occupied by feudal nobility, as we've seen in episode two of this podcast. But in the Mongol military machine, it was all about your actual skill. And the success of Chinggis Khan's system of meritocracy can be seen in the sheer explosive nature of many of his campaigns. Some of his generals definitely deserve to be considered history's greatest. For example, the General Subotai, who invaded, successfully invaded Hungary, Russia, uh, and campaigned all across the world. But it took a while for the Mongols to really reach this kind of point where they had turned into this tsunami of blood and destruction, as I described them at the beginning of this podcast. This new Mongol military machine really cut its teeth against the empires of the Jurchen and the Tangut, who were 
kingdom is based in roughly what is considered to be uh, the northern part of modern China. Now, these guys were in effect sedentary states. Uh, they had large armies of infantry. They used pikes. They had very large fortified citadels. And as you can imagine, an army that's sitting around riding on horses doesn't necessarily do that well against a massive city with huge, huge, thick earthen walls. In the early years of Chinggis Khan's career, that he began to figure out how to deal with siege warfare, began to figure out how to outmaneuver columns of heavy infantry supported by effective cavalry. The Mongol military machine was really feared for its uh, for its speed and mobility. As Aditya said, these guys used to go around with four to five horses. That meant that they could effortlessly change from one horse to another. So the horse that they had been riding would be rested, while another horse would now be exercising. The Mongols were known for uh, being able to survive on a very, very sparse and meager diet sometimes something as meager as a little bit of mare's blood mixed with a little bit of fermented milk uh, known as kumis was enough to keep them going for quite a while. Chinggis Khan also kind of pioneered this vast network of highways, this messenger system basically based on relays where a scout could move like dozens of kilometers in a single day, get access to a fresh horse at the end of it and then move on. So basically he could dispatch multiple armies. All these armies were composed of units of 10 a hundred, a thousand, and ten thousand men. And these armies, as they moved across a wide area, could coordinate with each other because of these highly effective systems of messengers. So they could very quickly surround, converge on enemy position, hit them, move back. And they were also really, really good at Parthian tactics, as it's called. How this worked is that the Mongols were really masters of feigned retreats. Now, this is something we saw the Turks also doing in episodes three and four, where they would ride up, shoot an enemy, or pretend to fall back in disarray, and then kind of flee, forcing the enemy, who are usually heavy infantry, much slower, much more cumbersome, to follow them. And then they would surround them and annihilate them with cavalry archery. So there, there were really a lot of things going for Genghis Khan in the early 13th century. After a series of remarkably successful campaigns in northern China, where, as I mentioned, they figured out how to combat and outmaneuver heavy infantry. They figured out how to use siege warfare very effectively, break down the walls of cities, and start to capture highly productive agrarian lands. Start to become much, much wealthier than they ever had. Genghis Khan seems to have slowly developed this vision of truly a world empire. No longer were the Mongols satisfied with just fighting against their ancestral enemies, the states of northern China, who had consistently been interfering in their affairs for the last few centuries. He gradually seemed to have realized that the Mongol military machine was really capable of building a world empire, of bringing the entirety of the world under their banner. Which is how he slowly turned his attention towards the West, towards Central Asia, where, as we've seen, there were many powerful states, including the Gurids, and of course their deadly rivals, the Karakhitai, and the big dog of Central Asia at the time, the Khwarezmian Empire. We've touched upon the Khwarezms before. Uh, they had remained a major force to be reckoned with in the region. In fact, the Gurids, who eventually founded the Delhi Sultanate, had initially directed most of their energies to the north and to the west against the Khwarezms. The thought that a power like this would disappear would have seemed very far-fetched. But the Khwarezms had made the great mistake of upsetting the Mongols. And now they stood in the way of Chinggis Khan's ambitions. In 1219, the Mongol war machine fell upon the Khwarezms. They were outclassed, outfought, outgeneraled in every way. The Khwarezm armies broke and fled everywhere. They were just drowned in showers of arrows. The Mongols just tore through their ranks with lances. They trampled on them with their mares. The Mongols also turned their wrath on Khwarezm cities. Uh, they would slaughter inhabitants, they would raise buildings, they, they turned proud urban centers into ghost towns. The Khwarezm Shah, who was in any case very unpopular, fled to a small island in the Caspian Sea and he soon died. Uh, but it's his more charismatic son, Jalaluddin, who continued the fight against the Mongols. He fled into what is today Afghanistan and raised a ragtag army of about 60,000 men in Ghazni. These would have been fleeing soldiers and loyalists combined with uh, local tribesmen who were just willing to put up a fight for a fee and maybe get a chance to do some looting. At first, they actually succeeded. They hit a small Mongol force that was pursuing them and actually defeated it. But this was really about buying time. Jalal needed to get away. And so he led his army down Khyber Pass into the plains of India. Now, Chinggis Khan who was fresh from having slaughtered the inhabitants of Bamiyan, 
pursued Jalal with an army of his own. He was going to make this his own personal task. And the Mongols surged through Khyber and descending, they would have seen the vast plains of India stretching before them. They would have heard of India's untold riches. India had not loomed large in the Mongols' imagination in the past. Genghis Khan had gone to war to smash the Khwarezm's challenge to his ambitions. But, you know, warfare has a logic of its own and it takes you places you didn't expect to go. Uh, it makes you do things that you didn't expect you'd have to do. For instance, now Genghis Khan needed to smash any remnants of Khwarezm royal authority. And in September of 1221, he found himself among Indian farms and villages, trotting amid the mud on this manhunt for Jalal. Chinggis Khan surprised Jalal one early morning on the banks of the Indus River. Just as Jalal's small army was trying to make it across to the other side, Jalal had with him by now not just his army, but also swarms of refugees. And as these refugees were trying to make it across, Jalal hastily tried to reorganize his army to put up a fight against the Mongols. At first, they actually managed to keep the Mongols at bay. But a small Mongol force scaled the walls of a nearby cliff and uh, basically managed to roll up Jalal's force from one flank. It was a disaster. Jalal and many of his soldiers simply took their horses and leapt into the river, swam, let the current take them where they could. There's a story that uh, Chinggis Khan told his men not to kill Jalal because uh, he was such a worthy man. We need not believe such propaganda. It's clear that Jalal simply made his... uh, way uh, downriver. And eventually he and uh, many of his Khwarezm soldiers would once again go west into other Muslim lands in the Middle East. Jalal himself was killed along the way. But uh, interestingly, many of Jalal's Khwarezm soldiers would make their mark in the wars against the Crusaders. That's actually quite fascinating. And, and it's, it's this weird connection almost to, at this point, almost forgotten Moiz al-Din, or as we know him, Muhammad of Ghor, who tried to portray himself, as we recall, as a crusader for Islam in India. Which, of course, brings us to the Delhi Sultanate. Now, why was it that the Delhi Sultanate did not offer asylum to Jalal al-Din, considering that he was a fellow Muslim, not just modern nationalists, but also Pan-Islamists at the time, if I can use that term, generally believed that against the pagan Mongols, Muslim rulers had a duty to unite. But we don't necessarily see the Delhi Sultanate getting involved uh, and trying to defend Jalal al-Din against Genghis Khan. And there's multiple reasons for that. First, of course, is a very, very good reason that Genghis Khan is Genghis Khan and nobody really wants to go up against him. The second reason, of course, is the fact that, as Aditya mentioned, the Khwarezmians weren't on the friendliest terms with the Ghurids. And quite early on in the Mongol invasion, it genuinely seemed like the Khwarezmians were contemplating an invasion of the Punjab to basically use that as a base to fight against the Mongols. And this was something that the Delhi Sultan would have been very well aware of. So we do know, for example, that um, Iltutmish, um, who at the time was the Sultan of Delhi, now, Iltutmish's early years were also fairly busy, roughly at the same time that Genghis Khan was conquering the plains of Central Asia, roughly the same time as the Mongol armies were first erupting into uh, Khwarezm. What Iltutmish was busy doing was defeating all the other smaller emirs and maliks who had taken over little swaths of northern India. Now, think about this. The way that we study the Delhi Sultanate, right, uh, the way that the history of the Delhi Sultanate is told, It's like it's inevitable. As soon as one chappy declares himself to be Sultan in Delhi, all the other little little fish, as it were, basically surrender all their authority to him. But that wasn't really the case. We saw in the last episode how Kutubuddin Aibeg um, fought against his rivals, Kabacha and Togril Beg. We also saw how El Totmish himself had to fight against other minor Turkish ghulams of his erstwhile owner, Muhammad of Ghor, in order to rise to the throne. Now, in the first 16 years of Il Totmish's reign, he spent most of it fighting against smaller Muslim emirates in northern India. If not for the fact that Il Totmish successfully defeated them, North India might have looked totally different. North India might have just been a collection of small Muslim kingdoms who were almost indistinguishable from other existing North Indian Hindu kingdoms uh, except for their religion. But Il Tutmish really laid the foundation for something different. He's the one who conquered all these smaller uh, emirs and maliks, as I said, and really laid the sultanate on a single foundation, really made it the most powerful Muslim state east of the Indus. 
Now, this powerful Muslim state had very clear memories of the Khwarezms. It knew very well about what the Mongols were doing, partly because of these types of refugees that Aditya mentioned. Now, some of these refugees were indeed amenable to signing up with the Khwarezm Shah, but many others had learned from the experience, from the trauma of seeing the Mongols destroy the Khwarezmian armies, destroying the Khwarezmian generals, destroying Khwarezmian cities, and didn't really think that signing up with Jalal al-Din was the best idea. So a lot of them really actually moved into Iltutmish's court, and oddly enough, they ended up strengthening the Delhi Sultanate. A lot of um, generals, a lot of uh, condottieri or mercenaries from Central Asia joined up there. Um, a lot of intellectuals from Persia and Central Asia found that this, this new court in Delhi, this tiny little court, which needed to administer these vast swathes of hostile territory, was going out of its way to offer good deals to them. And as you can imagine, a state that's on such a kind of shaky foundation that is still like accepting all these refugees is hardly going to piss off the most powerful man in the world, Genghis Khan, by offering asylum to one of his enemies. So what really emerges is that Iltutmish and Genghis Khan seem to come to an understanding. Iltutmish does not offer asylum to Jalal al din though he does offer asylum to all the other Khorasmians, which Genghis Khan doesn't really care about. And in return, Iltutmish doesn't really take any hostile action against the Khan. And with the end result being, of course, that Jalal al-Din uh, meets his tragic end. Chinggis Khan goes on his own way, rampaging through Persia, eventually returns to Central Asia, engages in a whole bunch of other campaigns. And the Delhi Sultanate goes on its own way. Yeah, I do want to stress that, in a sense, it was a really close call. Quite a few scholars actually think that Chinggis Khan was actually considering returning to China via India meaning he would head into the plains and he would probably find a route via the eastern Himalayas back into China. Hmm. Now, of course, any such uh, action would have meant the end of the Delhi Sultanate. It's really amazing how lucky the Delhi Sultanate got, not just then, but as we'll see through this episode on multiple occasions. It came awfully close to being wiped off the map by multiple powers, not just the Mongols, but also by Indian tribes and then Indian kingdoms. But we'll come to that in a little bit. So at this point, let's let's briefly talk about how exactly the Delhi Sultanate worked, right? So the way that the Delhi Sultanate maintained its power was that there was a, a very large number of these freeborn refugees of like, or often of like aristocratic birth, right? Uh, these generals that I was talking about, these administrators and intellectuals from Persia and Central Asia that I was talking about. And to kind of balance them off, Iltutmish basically cultivated a group called the Chihilgani. The Chihilgani are a group of slaves. We're not sure how many exactly there were. Some sources say 25, some sources say 40. And it was a fairly ethnically diverse group. There were Kipchaks, the same ethnicity as the Tutmish. Um, there were a few freeborn Turks, Turanians as they were called. There were some Habshis or Abyssinians, uh, Africans. And even in some cases, some Hindus. Now, we are told that, in fact, the leader of, of this entire group, the man who was considered to be a father almost to all these other um, slave nobles, was a Hindu. There were also uh, a few neo-Muslims or who are, who are actually Mongols who had converted to Islam. There were some unconverted Indians, we are told. There were some Khalaj tribesmen. And of course, there were some Afghans. Now, the Afghans were actually the least important of this whole lot. As you can imagine, this diverse group of people, some of them freeborn, some of them slaves of Viltutmish, were the central core of the Delhi Sultanate. These were the guys who controlled the most lucrative lands. These were the guys who controlled the most powerful armies. And they were the backbone, really, of the Sultanate. Now, El Tutmish was very well capable of keeping them in line because he was the guy who basically gave them power and all that. But none of his successors were really able to keep this group in line because, as you can imagine, they're not really a united group. They are these ethnic divisions. They are tribal divisions. There are differences in terms of how what they consider to be their importance. And any sultan who does not really take these people as seriously as they should gets wiped out. Now, after a fairly turbulent few decades where a number of Iltutmish's successors are basically replaced by the Chihilgani because they're too assertive or not assertive enough, eventually one of the Chihilgani manages to maneuver himself into a position where he's essentially the regent of the Delhi Sultanate, where he has a decisive edge over 
all of his other contemporaries among this chihilgani this man is ghiasuddin balban and balban is a fairly extraordinary character he's remarkably pragmatic he is also a dark and somber sort of individual a master politician but also a master of propaganda of administration after participating in a conspiracy that removed the last two sultans eventually balban himself becomes sultan and he starts to set into motion a great deal of interesting changes let me just read um, an inscription from delhi it's quite interesting in his kingdom abounding in benign rule extending from gauda to gajjana from the dravida region and from the setu bandha to the north where the entire region was filled with inner content the earth bore vernal floral charms produced by the rays of the innumerable precious stones and corals which dropped on it from the crowns of the bent heads of the rulers who came from every direction for his service when he went forth on a military expedition the gaudas abdicated their glory the anthras through fear sought the shelter of holes the keralas forsook their pleasures the karnatas hid themselves in caves the maharashtras gave up their places the gujaras resigned their vigor and the latas turned into kiratas the earth being now supported by the sovereign shesha altogether forsaking his duty of supporting the weight of the globe has betaken himself to the great bed of vishnu and vishnu himself for the sake of protection taking lakshmi on his breast and relinquishing all worries sleeps in peace on the ocean of milk this is a sanskrit inscription commemorating the reign of hamira ghiasamdina which is a little surprising balban um ghiasuddin balban soon after coming to his come into power is being praised in a sanskrit inscription that's being left in delhi now this is also an in, an interesting inscription in many ways because it describes the origin of delhi um, which was at that time called uh, shri yoginipura in in sanskrit it talks about the genealogy of the rulers of our delhi it talks about the genealogy of the people issuing this inscription it talks about the tomaras it talks about the early delhi sultans uh, mentioning one um, sahabuddina or shihabuddin uh, and coming up as i said to shri hamira gayasamdina giyasuddin balban and it's very interesting to see how even though the delhi sultanate is very often thought of as being nothing more than this barbaric conservative islamic state it clearly is going out of its way to also cultivate brahmins it's also clearly going out of its way to cultivate the old power centers of delhi and especially balban is doing that which is why this inscription is saying that vishnu can rest at ease because balban is in charge now this inscription is also interesting because it kind of presupposes a political continuity it doesn't necessarily see the delhi sultans as being incompatible with the principles of indian political culture uh, it very clearly is trying to portray them as a continuation of those who had come before it also reveals that the world of like north indian brahmins who were composing these sanskrit inscriptions had kind of expanded because it specifically says that his reign extends from gauda to gajana which of course is the sanskrit term for ghazni I'd like to emphasize the fact that Balban didn't actually control all this territory. It wasn't that the Bengalis of Gauda were actually afraid of him. It wasn't that the people of Kerala actually forsook their pleasures because of him. As I said earlier, the Delhi Sultanate was just one among many many competing polities within India. But it's fascinating to see how the people of Delhi kind of express the power of the Delhi Sultanate uh, with the same kind of terms that any other kind of Indian king would have used. And very clearly the political culture of this Islamic state is really not as incompatible with that of the rest of India as uh, we would often like to think. Now this is something that we'll come back to a little later but it's just something that I thought is worth pointing out. And that's not the only kind of reform that Balban brings into the Delhi Sultanate. Now Balban also is a very grim and stern sort of character. He goes about in public um, surrounded by bodyguards from Sistan in modern Pakistan. Of course that kind of demarcation really made no difference to uh, people living in the Delhi Sultanate at the time. and uh, these guys would would ride around him wearing shimmering um, 
armor made of scales with uh, an unsheathed sword which would gleam in the sunlight. And Balban himself was supposed to be a very dour and intimidating looking man with like this flowing white beard. And he would he would sit in, in, in public uh, receptions uh, really in, in a very grim and foreboding and threatening sort of way. That really kind of helped emphasize the authority of the sultans against the nobility in a way that no sultan before him had really been able to do. He kind of formalized the court culture of the Delhi Sultanate in that sense. And he also really broke uh, the power of the Chihilganis, um, those, these 40 slaves that I mentioned. He really centralizes the Sultanate in, in more ways than one. And his court, of course, once again becomes the becomes home to many, many refugees who, of course, are still being displaced by the depredations of the Mongols in West and Central Asia. We are told that by 1258, 25 Shehzadas of Iraq, Khorasan and other places with their retinues had sought refuge with Balban. Upwards of 15 of the unfortunate sovereigns from Turkestan, Khorasan, Iraq, Azerbaijan, Iran and modern Turkey, which at the time was called Rum, had also taken refuge there. So clearly, Balban was the kind of man who knew how to build a power base for himself. And what do you do with that power base? As you can imagine, the threat of the Mongols has hardly subsided. Now, by this point of time, Genghis Khan was no longer in control. But his successors were, if anything, even more brutal, even more absolutely savage in the way they treated other peoples of the world. And the threat to this tiny little Delhi Sultanate was still very, very real. So how exactly did Balban go about defending his realm from the Mongols? The short answer to that would be through a combination of armed force and diplomacy. Uh, Like you said, Anirudh, Balban was a master of the game of playing uh, court politics. And he did understand, especially during the time that he came to power himself, that you had to project a certain image of yourself. And he did not hesitate to promote this dar and remote image of who he was. But you can actually see Balban's efforts at managing the frontier emerge when he's actually still uh, a regent uh, to one of Iltutmish's sons. And uh, you already have evidence of Balban uh, figuring out how to deal with Mongol incursions uh, into the subcontinent. Now, at this time, the Mongol polity had been undergoing some key changes. By 1227, Genghis Khan himself was dead and his sons had taken over his empire. And they'd also begun the process of carving it up among themselves. Having said that, the Mongols were still a major threat. And in the mid-1200s, you do see major Mongol incursions into the subcontinent. Balban had a way of understanding what the Mongols really wanted and figuring out how to deal with it. So, for instance, Mm -hmm. in 1246, a small Mongol force uh, entered the plains of Punjab. They took Multan and they basically extorted Multan, forced the Multanese to give them 100,000 dinars. Then they went to Lahore and they extorted supposedly another 30,000 dinars along with, quote, 30 ass loads of soft goods and 100 captives, unquote. Hmm. Here's the interesting thing. In in roughly the same time, we're told that a very large number of Multani Hindu merchants gave loans to the Delhi Sultanate. Which is, which is quite interesting to think about, you know, that they're being screwed over by the Mongols. So they actually go and like are more friendly towards the Delhi Sultanate. So clearly it, it's not like the people of India just rolled over and let these, these two kind of invading foreign powers decide their fates. They're still very actively involved in like playing them off each other to kind of achieve their own interests. Yeah. In fact, uh, the Multani merchants were uh, masters of playing both sides. Uh, they would happily go and trade in Mongol lands as well. Uh, but, you know, speaking of the Mongols, what do they really want? At this stage, it's not clear at all that the Mongols were looking uh, at an invasion of India. They had more than enough on their hands. But uh, India was basically a useful cash cow, an ATM, if you will. You could always go into Northwest India and uh, extort some money, maybe loot, maybe force uh, local rulers to cough up cash. This is just exactly how the Ghurids and Ghaznavids had seen India for the longest time. Um, It's quite interesting to see that geopolitical pattern kind of repeat itself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The big difference, of course, was that now you had this very able power in Delhi. Now, at this time, the Delhi Sultanate is not what you imagine it. It's still a fairly young and fragile enterprise. It doesn't really control much beyond, uh, say, about the Bias River. 
a lot of the rest of the plains of Punjab are actually controlled either by Mongols or are basically this no man's land in between. There are a few things that Balban does that really helps solidify the Delhi Sultanate's defenses against the Mongols. Number one, he starts building a series of fortifications along the key routes that would be used by an invading army. Some of these fortifications are in the mountains themselves, for instance, in Samana, which actually became an area of fortifications most famously during the British colonial period. He would also build or strengthen uh, fortifications uh, in the plains, in whether in Dipalpur, Batinda, and in Delhi itself. The reason for fortifications is that uh, it actually complicates any Mongol war plan. If you have uh, fortifications, it means that you can have people inside those forts. If the Mongols decide to bypass those forts, uh, they could have somebody in their rear. The Mongols also depend very heavily on foraging for their horses. And uh, these people in forts can actually sortie out and uh, hamper the Mongols' uh, freedom of movement and hence their mobility, their ability to get to, say, for example, Delhi. That's fascinating. And I'd really like to kind of emphasize this since you mentioned Bhatinda, Aditya. In the last episode, we talked about how um, Bhatinda was basically a bone of contention between the Ghurids and the Chahamanas who ruled that part of India. Clearly, the Chahamanas had been using a similar series of fortifications to defend against Turkish invaders, uh, to block off their routes of invasion, to harry their supply lines. And what the Turks are doing now that they are in charge of that same area um, is defending against a new Central Asian power by kind of strengthening the existing fortifications um, that have been there for centuries. And uh, once again, it's like a fascinating continuation of the same geopolitical pattern, but with different protagonists. That's exactly right. The one advantage that the Delhi Sultanate had that uh, the Chahamanas didn't is that they did control more of Punjab. That did allow them to extend their fortifications over a wider area. The other thing that Balban did was he used diplomacy. By the 1250s, Mongol geopolitics was also changing. Uh, Hulegu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, basically went on a rampage by first taking on the Ismaili assassin's cult in Afghanistan and then moving westwards right across the Middle East. After this lightning campaign in the Middle East, Hulegu really needed to consolidate his power and it made sense to have at least a sort of temporary peace with the Indians. And in 1259, Hulegu and Balban came to an understanding and to a treaty. Hulegu actually sent a a diplomatic mission uh, to Delhi. For Balban, this was a perfect chance to showcase Delhi Sultanate's military might. He organized elaborate ceremonies. He organized a hunt. Uh, Now, hunts were for Balban very much a form of military exercises. Hunts required the army to be marshaled, for it to move as an organized force, to practice its logistical abilities. And uh, all of this was on display for the Mongol ambassadors. You know, we talk about, we use the word deterrence today. Uh, Deterrence only works when the other side knows your capabilities. And Balban was determined to show the Mongols what the Delhi Sultanate was capable of. It also will not escape us that any ambassador coming to Delhi would also get a sense of at least some of the fortifications, not just in Delhi, but also along the way. They would also get a sense of the lay of the land. You might think this is a disadvantage, but for the Mongols, uh, going deep into the plains of India is uh, it's really it's out of their element it's beyond their comfort zone uh, the mongols don't particularly like uh, endless farmland uh, it, it's a lousy terrain for mongol horsemen each of whom would take with them four or five horses and each of those horses would need to be fed and watered on a daily basis. That's a really interesting point, Aditya. I mean, I would never have thought that the very fact that Northern India was so cultivated was precisely the reason that the Mongols weren't able to invade because, as you said, they wouldn't have had enough pasture land for their horses. And I also came across a couple of interesting arguments um, regarding the way that Balban intimidated the Mongols. This hunt that you talked about, basically how the hunt would work, was that you would have horsemen spread out in a, in a 
circle over a very very wide area with drummers um and this circle would would basically contract in a very organized kind of way so just think about what it takes to have like hundreds of horsemen spread out over a wide area and and coordinate the kind of shrinking of this circle to drive animals before it um so clearly what balbar is trying to do is to show these ambassadors that my cavalry archers my horsemen are no less accomplished than yours are and we're also told that at one point there was a review of 200000 infantry men and 50000 horses which balban basically pastured made the ambassadors kind of walk through to kind of intimidate them with the show of force yes. of course not all of these uh, not all of these men were part of delhi's standing army they were mostly raised from delhi's provincial governors from from various different parts of india that the delhi sultan had controlled which again is mostly like north india the gangetic plains but it must have had quite an effect on on the mongols right so keep in mind that this is in 1260 it's only about Two years after Hulagu Khan did something that absolutely devastated the Muslim world in 1258, he had attacked uh, and comprehensively looted and sacked Baghdad, supposedly for 30 days. And the 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 rivers outside Baghdad are supposed to have flowed black and red with all the ink of the libraries that was thrown into the rivers, with all the books that were thrown to the rivers, and with the blood of all of its slaughtered citizens. And of course, the Abbasid Caliph. who we've seen in various capacities in yuddha up to this point because uh, the legitimacy of the abbasid caliph was so important to all of these upstart warlords uh, such as mahmud of ghazni muhammad of ghor and of course the delhi sultanate iltutmish himself for example had declared himself to be the lieutenant um, of the of the of the commander of the faithful which is the abbasid caliph he had actually received robes from the caliph Yes, he had, um, and 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 the way that the caliph was killed was in the traditional Mongol fashion. Supposedly, uh, the Mongol tradition was that royal blood should never be spilled on the ground. So, how they killed the caliph was that they put him into a carpet or into a bag and had him trampled to death uh, with horses, which was which is a brutal and and horrifyingly painful way to die. but uh, this news when it first reached india as you can imagine was was met with absolute horror there were there were all these um legends going about that um the mongols were absolutely undefeatable that they were monsters pagans who had come to basically end the, the muslim world and so on and that was one of the reasons for example why the delhi sultanate had a slightly more conservative religious streak um because it, it there would have been a genuine belief think about it this happened not just in europe but also in the muslim world there was a genuine belief that the mongols were the scourge of god uh, that they had been sent to punish the faithful for not being faithful enough um of course that would change later but we'll come to that later for now i just like to emphasize the fact that keeping the mongols at bay was no simple task balban as aditya mentioned and not only strengthened the lines of fortification not only intimidated them with his ambassadors but is also credited with being one of the first sultans to really create a standing army which would have been an enormously expensive task think about it he supposed to have raised 17 to 18000 cavalry men who were positioned um, in in lines of fortification i think around multan and sistan and and these guys were were meant to like constantly be on the lookout for mongols and it's not cheap to maintain thousands of men constantly in the field you have to constantly feed them uh, you have to make sure their their horses are are in good order you have to make sure um that they have appropriate arms and equipment so clearly there was a lot of like internal reforms that were happening in the delhi sultanate not just political not just cultural but also administrative also military in order to keep the mongols at bay Yes, Anirudh, you talked about uh, having cavalrymen in forts. Now, the reason you would have cavalrymen in forts is not only because they can patrol widely and uh, and act as scouts, reporting on potential Mongol movements, but also because they are exactly the sort of people that can make foraging by Mongols very difficult uh, in the event of a Mongol incursion. What's also inter- very interesting is the kind of hunt that uh, Balban organizes. The hunt that he organizes, as you said. involved a large body of troops basically encircling a large number of animals this is very similar to the nerge the traditional mongol way of hunting which also served as a sort of military exercise for the mongols so i think the lesson could simply not have been lost on the mongols uh, this was definitely a part we reckoned with and the mongols had to very seriously think about whether the risks were worth the payoffs especially at a time when they were already sensing the limits of their own power and we can also be sure that whatever the mongol ambassador told hulegu uh, would have actually fallen on fairly receptive ears hulegu was by this time aware that there were limits to mongol expansion 
one of his lieutenants had actually been defeated by Mamluks and other Turkic people in a battle in what is today Israel and those were all really the limits to as far as Mongols could go easily and it was clear that the Mongols were really testing the ecological limits of their expansion uh, like I like we've said before Mongol armies depended heavily on foraging and there are places in the world where that's simply not very easy north india to a great extent is one of them but the deserts of the middle east would also prove that these limits did exist to the west as well uh, the other place that the mongols were finding those limits was in china itself the song dynasty to the south uh, really represented a very different climate topography uh, there was a lot of rice paddy cultivation this is a very different world from the china that the mongols were ru- ruling in the north and once again the mongols were struggling to expand their power there was also the problem of internal divides within the mongol polity there was not just bad blood between the children and grandchildren of chinggis khan you also for instance had one faction of the mongols the golden horde uh, having converted to islam and this put them at odds with uh, hulegu's ilkhanids in persia uh, and so you really had uh, these internal divisions arising within the mongols at the same time that they were finding that they could not expand further into the middle east uh, further into southern china to some extent into india and also into western europe now one would have thought that this was really the perfect time for balban to go on the offensive and kind of uh, perhaps push into central asia gain a little more territory at the expense of the mongols but that wasn't something that was really an option for him because as i alluded to earlier in this discussion the kings of india were nowhere near defeated by this point um, in fact uh, barani who is a later a chronicler of the delhi sultanate um, and is of course like famously unreliable because the way that barani writes history is to basically uh, promulgate his own theory of kingship which unfortunately we don't really have time to get into right now but basically he he contrives a speech between balban and his his lieutenants where uh, balban's lieutenants say why do you not go to war with the hindus uh, basically and balban says if i were to take my attention off my northwest for even the tiniest moment uh, the mongols would attack and that would be the end of the days delhi sultanate as we know it and um, as contrived as as this speech may be it's not inaccurate in fact uh, one of the earliest campaigns that balban uh, indulged in was against a people called the mayos or the mewatis now today uh, the mewatis are muslims but they claim to be descended from krishna and rama uh, who supposedly according to them uh, were prophets uh, who were not recognized by islam now um the mayors uh, created a great deal of trouble for balban because um they basically uh, controlled many of the jungles and thick forests in the neighborhood of delhi balban is recorded to have basically cut down a lot of these forests and like expanded farmland in an attempt to bring the mayors to heel but it wasn't just the mayors there were a very large number of indian kings uh, aristocratic families that had taken to the forests as a result of the conquest of delhi sultanate um, now these are all places where muslim heavy cavalry simply cannot go and the the indians seem to have developed a, a version of like hit and run or guerrilla tactics constantly harrying muslim supply lines uh, harrying uh, lines of communication between uh, various muslim provinces in north india and more than these uh, dispossessed kings the real threat to the sultanate of course came from from the established kingdoms for example the chandelas now we talked about the chandelas in episode 3 uh, where we saw them basically uh, reaching a modus vivendi with mahmud of ghazni now the chandelas had lost of course their great fort of kalinjor but the chandela king still retained the title of king of kalinjor um, and had moved his capital just a little off to the southeast of kalinjor uh, he continued his wars against the turks and also of course against all his other um, indian rivals including the paramaras um, including the kings of chedi which is uh, broadly uh, southern chatisgarh and similarly the kings of orissa the kings of gujarat will all claim stuff like we annihilated the turks and rescued the earth like varaha rescued uh, the earth from the ocean and all these dramatic pronouncements but at the same time these guys are also fighting each other uh, so very clearly it seems almost that the political culture of of northern india remained more or less intact the geopolitical culture if you will where the the kings of india basically now considered this little sultanate to be yet another kingdom just like theirs and they would go to war with it raid it just as they would go to war with and raid all the other indian neighbors 
And of course, there's something that Delhi Sultanate themselves understood very well. Um, it's quite curious to see them basically doing the exact same thing the other Indian kings were doing to these other Indian kings. It was rare for them to send out expeditions at this point. But when they did, these were primarily plundering expeditions, primarily kind of displaced to kind of show Delhi's military might, not just to the other Indian kings, but also to their own vassals. But really, the relationship between the Delhi Sultanate and other Indian powers was nowhere near as confrontational as we're led to believe very often. Uh, of course, that would change in the decades to come, but that was really down to one particularly remarkable individual whom we'll come to very soon. Um, the basic point to take away from all this was that there were multiple threats that Delhi Sultanate had faced, both in the northwest and off to its, its southeast. It had to face its own internal rebellions, its own like internal politicking. Um, and Balban was one of the few sultans who managed to successfully surmount all these threats, successfully keep the Mongols at bay, successfully kind of strengthen the power of the Sultanate and make it rest on a more secure foundation. This was not something that his successors would be able to do. And as we'll see, within a few decades, the broader geopolitical picture that Delhi was part of had almost completely transformed. Um, And the Mongols were now starting to be a lot more aggressive towards India. One reason for this renewed aggressiveness Uh, was actually the politics of the steppe. As we had mentioned earlier, by now the Mongol Empire had collapsed into five successor states. And one of the smaller of these successor states is what we know now in history as the Chagatai Khanate. Now, the Chagatai Khanate may have been weak in relation to the other states, but that also meant that it had an incentive to mount plundering raids into India to basically raise money and fight those other successor states more effectively. So you see an intense connection developing between the Chagatai Khanate and events in India. Mm. The Chagatais start raiding into India and eventually they start looking at the potential for long-term conquest of the subcontinent. So once again, India had managed to get extremely lucky because by the time that the Chagatayids were trying to look at India in a more aggressive way, the anarchy, if I can use that term, or really the political turmoil that followed the death of Balban had more or less kind of resolved itself. Now, just as with the descendants of Iltutmish, the descendants of Balban had proved incapable of actually like harnessing um, all the kind of fractious amirs of the Delhi Sultanate, which eventually led to a compromise candidate, a chap called Jalal al-Din Khilji, uh, being raised to the throne. Now, Jalal al-Din is an interesting character because uh, he comes to the throne at a time when the Mongols are increasingly aggressive and the power of Balban's old ghulams and nobles is still not completely broken. In fact, early on in his career, uh, he had to defeat Balban's nephew, a chap called Malik Chaju. And uh, Malik Chaju, interestingly enough, um, is supposed to have somewhere near Prayagraj uh, or Allahabad, is supposed to have performed a tambola ceremony, which is when the vassals of an Indian king would come and accept betel leaf and camphor from his hand. So clearly, he was actually working with the Hindu aristocracy to kind of unseat Jalal al-Din. That attempt was not successful. Jalal al-Din kind of managed to consolidate power. But more than Jalal al-Din, it's really his nephew, Ala al-Din, who would prove to be the kind of the, the wall that would break the power of the Mongols in India. Alaldin is a most remarkable character. Uh, we will get into another aspect of his career in the next episode. But in this episode, uh, suffice it to say that through an extremely daring raid through hostile territory into the tip of the Deccan, uh, he managed to secure an enormous amount of wealth, which enabled him to basically rise up against and murder his uncle and also his father-in-law, Jalal al Khilji. So it was now Ala al uh, this ambitious young man, who seemed to have the favor of fortune around him, as it were, who very much saw himself as a second Alexander, as he called himself, who had ambitions of conquering the entire world or failing that of at least conquering the entire Indian subcontinent. This ambitious young man uh, who had risen to the throne of arguably India's most turbulent, most foreign-facing polity, executed a purge against all of Balban's nobles, executed a purge against all all of those nobles who had been loyal to him. Um, And with a much more kind of uh, close and iron-fisted hand, brought the power of the Delhi Sultanate together and looked to the northwest, where the Mongols were coming at last. 
Yeah, the rise of the Khiljis is extraordinarily fascinating. If you look, just go back to Alauddin's uh, uncle, Jalaluddin. Uh, the place he sets up, even after he becomes Sultan, for example, is in Kilugadi, which is an area outside what was then Delhi. Delhi was focused around this nucleus of uh, Meheroli. Uh, Kilugadi is, uh, you know, modern Kilkori. It's near New Friends Colony, if you're familiar with the lay of the land in Delhi. And, uh, you know, just north of that is Giaspur, where you have the Sufi saint of the Chisti order, Nizamuddin Aulia, preaching his faith. So you start seeing this urbanization around Delhi. Mm. And this is going to have some fairly important consequences for how the city is going to be defended from the invaders coming from the northwest. Now, uh, Alauddin Khilji, like you said, fashioned himself or imagined himself to be the second Alexander, Sikandar Sani is what he called himself. Mm. And uh, at one point, he's actually quoted as saying uh, he would actually like to leave someone in charge in Delhi and go out into the world like Alexander and pursue conquest. Mm. Of course, uh, cooler heads prevailed. Uh, They told him he still needs to focus on those Mongols. And that's exactly what he did. In understanding this uh, Mongol threats, uh, Anirudh and I are very much indebted to scholars like K.S. Lal and Peter Jackson and how they've basically guided us through a lot of the primary sources. So the first major Mongol invasion of India after Alauddin comes to power, like barely a year after he comes to power, was in 1297. And, uh, you know, Alauddin was still busy consolidating his power, but he really didn't have much time to rest because the Mongols had sent an army of 100,000 men. As we mentioned earlier in this episode, the Mongols had a decimal system for dividing up their army. So a force of 10,000 soldiers would be called a Tumen. So this was probably 10 Tumens or 100,000 men. These men would be riding on multiple horses and camels, and they swept into the subcontinent. Alauddin himself did not leave Delhi to fight them. Instead, he sent out two of his generals, Zafar Khan and Oluk Khan. And they met this invading Mongol army somewhere near Jalandhar and defeated it. And we are told that some 20,000 Mongols died, that many Mongols were taken prisoner and then, of course, eventually brutally executed. They were executed by trampling under elephants, in case anyone is wondering. Yeah, so it is not a very pleasant thing to be a Mongol uh, taken prisoner by the Delhi Sultanate. You would be trampled by elephants. We have a description from a little later from Ibn Battuta describing how an elephant would use its trunk to fling a man into the air and then cut him apart with swords attached to its tusk. So not a pleasant way to go. And more interestingly, there's something that I just recently found out, by the way, is that uh, human blood can actually be used to make mortar or cement. Now, the Romans, for example, if you look at a lot of their most colossal architectural achievements, such as the Colosseum, for example, they were all put together using a mortar that contained, among many things, pig's blood, uh, which is also mixed with volcanic pumice and so on. Now, some sources claim that Alauddin's Mongol prisoners would basically be pulverized and their blood was used to build the new fortifications that he was constructing around Delhi to keep it safe from the Mongols. So it was clearly meant as this kind of blood-curdling message that any Mongol invasions of India would be met with absolute savage brutality and thus make it harder for Mongols to kind of recruit these soldiers of fortune who might want to join them. Actually, what's remarkable is that it took the Mongols a long time to get this message. (laughs) They still believed that they could win. And you can't hardly blame them. I mean, the Mongols had conquered such a huge part of Eurasia. And uh, it was very rare for the Mongols to actually find an army that could stop them. Which is why very soon after this initial attack of 1297-1298, the Mongols are right back at it again in 1299. Mm. And 1299 must surely be one of the most violent years in northern India. Because it starts out with this raid into Sindh. Uh, The Mongols take uh, Sivistan in that region. Mm. And uh, once again, Zafar Khan and Uluk Khan are dispatched. They lay siege to Sivistan. And uh, the sources tell us they don't even bother to use siege engines like Manjaniks or Mangonels. Instead, they simply just surround the place, they shower it with arrows, and eventually the Mongols give up. Mm. Now, you would think that this is a fairly small invasion. You know, what's going on here? Well, as it turned out, the real show was just about to start because it was in late 1299 that a new Mongol army, this time consisting of some 20 Tumans or about 200,000 men, swept into the plains from the passes. Now, just try and imagine what an army of 200,000 Mongols looked like. We know from some sources that by this time, they were not using maybe four or five horses per man, but maybe two horses and one camel. So let's conservatively imagine that's what they had. That would still mean about 600,000 beasts of burden. Mm. If you can just imagine such an army trampling across the fields in Punjab, 
you know, from the moment that you saw the vanguard of this army to the moment where the last Mongol warrior rode by, it would probably be several hours, mm. you know, uh, and along the way, they would basically leave a scene of devastation. What's also really interesting about this invasion is that, again, we're told that the Mongols this time brought their own forage. One of the weaknesses of these uh, Mongol invasions into India was that, you know, horses need to be fed, they need fodder. And uh, so the Mongol armies had to constantly fan out into the countryside, get fodder, collect fodder, bring it back. That slowed down their movement. And the soldiers that the Delhi Sultanate had strategically kept in these forts could also sally forth and uh, harass these Mongols. Exactly. I think I think it, it's, it's very interesting to kind of see this kind of arms race and how cavalry and cavalry archers are being used, right? So the Mongols have this uh, fantastic technique of like highly mobile armies uh, that mostly rely on foraging. They are not able to initially like penetrate into India, especially during Balban's reign, because Balban has figured out how to use like cavalry forts to harry their supply lines and make it very difficult for them to forage. And now having learned from Balban and broadly the Delhi Sultan and strategy, the Mongols are now carrying their own forage. So the possibility of their supply lines uh, being harassed or weakened is, is actually much less. So they can actually bypass a lot of the lines of the fortification and get much deeper into Delhi territory than they would have been able to just a generation ago. Exactly. One of the advantages of this uh, mobility is that the Mongols are now able to basically avoid being harassed by those Indian forts. So, for instance, the forts at uh, Samana or Dipalpur are not actually able to stop this Mongol force or in any significant way harass them. Mm. These guys are just headed straight to Delhi. Also, you know, if you just to try and imagine how does this mo- a force like this stop? How does it set up camp at night? How does it get going in the morning? Uh, we have a very fascinating account uh, by a European observer of the Mongols in the 1270s. Mm. And he talks about how uh, the Mongols would, in the morning, uh, just before daybreak, use a series of drums to indicate what needs to be done. And so he says, and I quote, the first time a drum is beaten, the Mongol soldiers get up, they prepare their horses, and they're ready to go. And then when the drum is beaten for a second time, they strike their tents, they load up all their possessions, and they assemble into their specific units. And then drum is uh, struck for a third time and uh, they start moving in systematic order. The Mongol warriors who are supposed to be in the vanguard go first, followed by the others, and finally the rear guard. So there is clearly a very systematic way in which they do this. And observers are always struck by how little noise the Mongols make. You know, the animals are not being noisy. People are not shouting and screaming. There's no apparent chaos. Mm. Even with a force of, say, 200,000 men, maybe 600,000 beasts of burden, maybe tens of thousands of camp followers, the Mongols remain remarkably disciplined and organized. It hardly needs to be said for a polity like the Delhi Sultanate, this is an absolutely mortal threat. Yeah. It's fascinating to kind of contrast this with one description I've read of what a marching medieval Indian army looked like. So this would have been um, a fair bit of time before the Mongols, right? This is from roughly the early 600s uh, CE. And uh, it's from the court of Harshavardhana, this North Indian emperor, which describes a camp that is very, very different. It's ex- Even though drums are also used to kind of coordinate the overall striking of camp and so on, it would have been an extremely noisy affair. The poet uh, waxes eloquently about uh, how people were constantly like singing and gossiping and the braying of, of, of donkeys and the trumpeting of elephants and horses just resounded through the air. It's quite a striking contrast that the Mongols were able to maintain discipline across such a huge number of people. And to see uh, that mass of people moving silently with perfect discipline, heading straight towards you, basically like stripping the land bare as it moved must have been a truly terrifying sight. Yeah, terrifying it must have been because we do know of whole waves of refugees at this point pouring into Delhi. You know, this advancing army must have basically set off large columns of refugees basically looking for shelter or safety anywhere they could get it. And naturally, one of the places you would head to is Delhi. Delhi has walls. Delhi has an army. And pretty soon we hear about uh, supplies getting scarce in Delhi, prices going up. And by the time this large Mongol army starts fanning out around the outskirts of the city, it also becomes really uh, difficult for traders or for goods to get into the city. So the city is also getting short of supplies. Mm. Of course, Aladdin had not been wasting time. As soon as he heard about this Mongol incursion into India, he started preparing. 
He sent out word for all uh, armies involved in conquest elsewhere to head back to Delhi. Uh, he started making provisions within the city. But not everybody was terribly happy with this. You know, you have this uh, quote from the court wall of uh, Delhi who's warning Alauddin that most of his army consists of Indians who fought other Indians and don't necessarily understand these tactics of the Mongols. But of course, Alauddin did not have the luxury to not fight. And so he heads out with a vast army, which includes his generals, Uluk Khan and Zafar Khan, who are so experienced in fighting Mongols. And they meet this Mongol army at a place called Kili, which is just on the outskirts of Delhi. This is a semi-arid land of often bar- barren rock, uh, camel thorns. We're told that the Sultanate's army uh, had one flank against the Jamuna River and the other against a large patch of uh, scrub brush. Mm. So so in that sense, their flanks were protected. The Mongols also similarly arrayed themselves against this army. And the Mongols had to defeat the Sultanate army because time was not on their side. Their fodder and their logistic supplies would only last so long. Uh, the Sultanate army was already home. Yeah. Uh, it enjoyed interior lines of communication. Uh, it could buy time. The Mongols could not. They had to attack. The first action that we know of in this Battle of Kili occurred when Zafar Khan, who was on the right wing of the Sultanate army, attacked the Mongols. Uh, and immediately the Mongols on his opposite side, on the left, withdrew. They started going back. Zafar Khan pursued them and victory of some sort over there seemed to be in sight. Of course, the Mongols, like all nomadic armies before them, including the Turks, were experts of the parting shot, which is they could turn around on their horses and loose shafts back at you even as they fled. Mm. And this started causing casualties amongst Safar Khan's men. But he continued this pursuit and uh, things looked bad for the Mongols. What happened was that another force of Mongols, perhaps about 10,000, maybe another two men, uh, was waiting in ambush for him to return. Hmm. And so when Safar Khan was convinced that he had driven away uh, the Mongol left wing from the battlefield and was returning to join Alauddin Khilji and to join the main fight, he was ambushed by this two men and he and his men were surrounded eventually. Hmm. We have poetic descriptions of their last stand. Zafar Khan had, had his horse shot under him, but then he laid out his shafts of arrow on the ground and then continued to loose shafts at the Mongols, dropping one Mongol with every shaft. And of course, eventually he was surrounded and killed. Now, there's a fair bit of stuff to actually unpack here, right? So one thing that you didn't mention when you started Aditya was the fact that the Delhi Sultanate deployed armored war elephants in front of its line. Now, this is something that we actually saw in the previous episode, which the Chahamanas were actually using against the forces of Muhammad of Ghor. These armored war elephants were basically meant to kind of uh, screen the infantry and cavalry that were behind them from Mongol archery fire. Now, and it seems that these elephants were also fairly effective, like frontline fighting units. Once the battle actually started, they acted as a screen that would allow like cavalry archers behind them to fire against the enemy and so on. So basically, Al- Alauddin was in the center of the formation. Oluk Khan, another senior general of his, which Aditya mentioned in the Sivistan campaign, uh, was commanding the left flank. And both of these guys seem to be holding their own. Now, imagine from their perspective, when they see the Mongol left flank, like slowly giving way, crumbling before the force of Zafar Khan's onslaught and then Zafar Khan eventually pursuing them, smashing them, returning to the fight and in the process being surrounded and ambushed. Now, what would Alauddin Khilji have done? What could potentially he have done? Zafar Khan has clearly proved himself to be an extremely able commander. Um, As Aditya mentioned, the Mongols are spreading these kind of tidal waves of fear in front of them wherever they go. Clearly, a lot of people would have thought of Zafar Khan as a hero. This guy, therefore, is a military and a political rival of Alauddin's. He's also a brave general of his, but he has made a fatal mistake. Now, Alauddin could have moved to kind of support Zafar Khan and therefore save him, or he could choose to uh, safeguard his possession, keep the Mongols at bay, and perhaps retreat to fight another day. Because as Aditya mentioned, before this battle, the Mongols knew they had to have a decisive victory because their lines of communication already stretched. Whereas Alauddin did have better supplies, he could continue to fight. And what exactly happened next? What happened to the brave Zafar Khan? So the brave Zafar Khan is surrounded and he is killed. But neither Uluk Khan nor Alauddin Khilji go to his help. Now, some medieval chroniclers as well as modern historians have concluded that this is simply because Alauddin wanted Zafar Khan to die, that uh, he saw this as a convenient way to get rid of this very capable general who was destined to be a rival of his. 
Now, Alauddin Khilji is obviously a completely ruthless man and he would have no compunctions about letting anyone die. Mm. But as a military decision, his action of not going to Zafar Khan's help, you know, in combat as in life, what you don't do is as important at least as what you don't do. Uh, you know, that decision to not go to his help, I think was a very sound one. It was a very sensible one. It may have been ruthless, but I think it actually helped save the day. Uh, because even as Zafar Khan was uh, conducting this pursuit and was eventually ambushed, the main Mongol force actually advanced and uh, tried to attack uh, the Sultanate's armies. But of course, like you said, the Sultanate's armies had this composite force. You had a screen of elephants who were probably also defended by some infantrymen. You had archers behind them. Mm. You had cavalry. And they were really able to push back the Mongols. We also hear that in the process of pushing back this Mongol attack, they managed to rescue several Indian soldiers who were being held prisoner. Now, I just want to stress that from everything that we hear about the Battle of Kili, we can see a lot of very typical Mongol tactics. One that we've just discussed is the way that the Mongols basically ambush and kill Zafar Khan. We've seen the Mongols do very similar things in the Caspian region, in Eastern Europe. The other is... Uh, using screens of prisoners in the vanguard of your attack. That's what the Mongols seem to have done, done at Kili as well. Basically using captured Sultanate soldiers as arrow fodder. And Alauddin was not the kind of person to be dissuaded by that kind of tactic, as we've seen with his calculated, but as Aditya said, sensible sacrifice of Zafar Khan. But what happened after that, Aditya? I mean, I would assume that now that the Mongols have dealt a devastating blow to Delhi's right flank, that they would start rolling up Delhi's line from the right. But that didn't really happen, did it? Well, yeah, it didn't happen. One reason I think is simply having been pushed back so effectively, they were quite weakened and shaken. The other is that it would appear that Kutlu Khwaja himself, the leader, was mortally wounded. Mm. And uh, eventually the Mongols... Uh, slipped away at night. And from what the sources tell us, they made their way back across the Khyber Pass as quickly as they made their way uh, into the subcontinent. Hmm. Uh, that's it's, it's quite a interesting turn of events. It's, and it seems like overall a close-run thing. If a few things had gone differently, Alauddin might have faced a serious defeat. It might have seriously upended the political equations upon which his authority rested. But he managed to pull through. And I think part of the reason for that was the fact that Alauddin is fairly remarkable economic and administrative mind as well. He's, he's really a Indian Renaissance man, if I can use that term. Uh, he's not just great at politics, but he's also great at the actual business of rule. Now, one thing that Alauddin did in order to kind of give the Delhi Sultan the kind of military forces it needed to fight the Mongols was a series of expansive economic reforms. These were basically designed to kind of break the power of the Hindu uh, landowning aristocracy. We've seen like throughout this episode, right, we saw Balban struggling to bring them under heel. We saw Alauddin's uncle, Jalaluddin, fighting Malik Chaju, who was supported by the Hindu aristocracy. And it really seemed that the Hindu aristocracy was more or less safe in, in their hill forts, in their forest fortifications, uh, had a lot of land under their control, which they were able to use to kind of mobilize resources that were used against the Sultanate. And what Alauddin did was implement this highly oppressive system of taxation. Everybody from village chieftains to even village watchmen, we are told, uh, who were a menial caste, were forced to pay pretty back-breaking taxes. These were uh, collected on an annual basis. They were assessed on the basis of the quality of land, the, the kind of crops that were grown there. And they were collected extremely regularly and with, as you can imagine, with fairly savage brutality uh, backing them up. But they did succeed. So the net effect of all these kind of taxation system reforms was to transfer ever more of the agrarian surplus to the urban center of Delhi. Um, and it wasn't just agrarian surplus that was coming there in larger numbers than ever before. Alauddin had this system of like actually maintaining a very large standing army. We know of at least two types of trooper that Alauddin uh, recruited through monetary incentives, uh, especially of having like a fixed salary, right? Uh, so this professional military was composed of some cavalrymen called Duashpas, who seem to have been lightly armored Indian cavalrymen um, who had two horses. He would receive a salary from the state that was expected to keep him and his horses in good health. This grade of soldier was supposed to have been able to capture at least 10 Mongols uh, in pitched combat. Um, above them were a class of cavalrymen called the Muratab, who seem to have been Muslim cavalrymen, 
who were heavily armored. Of course, their armor and all was paid for by the state and was supposed to have been able to capture 100 Mongols in pitched combat. So clearly what Alauddin is doing is recruiting a highly capable, highly talented military force. But surprisingly enough, even though we do know that these guys got fixed salaries, they don't seem to have been that excessive according to the currency of the time. And the reason for that was perhaps Alauddin Khilji's most pervasive and most extraordinary reform, uh, which is something that's totally unique and honestly unparalleled in the medieval world and could only have been done by a man who was as ambitious and as ruthless and as intelligent as Alauddin Khilji was. This was probably the world's most extensive system of price controls ever seen and that will ever be seen. Alauddin had a bureaucracy and a network of spies that controlled the price prices of everything from camels to slaves to cloth and also had a system of permits that were used to make sure that no, the nobility would not buy up stuff for cheap in Delhi and sell them at a great expense elsewhere. This even had a system where merchants who kind of incentivized paid up front to go and get stuff from deeper within the provinces and very large granaries were, were, were kind of maintained by the state to ensure that prices stayed low. The end result of this elaborate administrative system was was that Alauddin could maintain a very, very large standing army without spending too much and without having to mint currency that would lead to like skyrocketing inflation. It's a fairly remarkable achievement. You know, let's not mince words about it. Aditya mentioned Ibn Battuta earlier now and Ibn Battuta visited Delhi a couple of generations later. He still tells us how more than like a hundred years later, uh, the system of price controls that Alauddin had implemented was seen as this great wonder of ages bygone. It was never successful successfully recreated and has never really been successfully recreated even today. Of course, this problem of like having a large agrarian surplus, which is being eaten by an even larger uh, group of like people who don't produce stuff, right? People who aren't craftsmen, people who aren't agrarian producers, but people whose only job is to fight enemies would be something that other generations of Delhi Sultans would have to tackle. But that again is something that we will see in, in later episodes. Now, let's come back to Al- Alauddin himself. Now, he'd, he'd done all these reforms he had managed to build up a really large standing army that was capable of taking on the Mongols and managed to successfully um, defeat one uh, Mongol invasion of the Battle of Kili, as we've seen. What happens next? As you can imagine, this ambitious young man now sets about uh, trying to defeat all the other Indian kingdoms. Now, once again, I'd like to circle back to the beginning of this podcast where we talked about Sultan il Tutmish and how he managed to create this kind of united sultanate instead of leaving India in the hand of like a number of small kind of Indo-Muslim kingdoms. And even the generations after il Tutmish, the power of the Indian kingdoms had never really been broken. Once again, we talked about how uh, these guys were raiding Delhi, Delhi was raiding them. None of them really had a decisive edge. But because of Alauddin Khilji's reforms, Delhi slowly starts to gain a larger and larger advantage. Its army starts to grow larger and larger than any of its contemporaries. Its tactics, its generals, especially thanks to constantly fighting of the Mongols, are of a totally different caliber than anything that any other Indian state can can muster. So Alauddin starts to use this army to kind of carve a way into the deep south, the one place where Delhi's armies have really not yet managed to reach. Um, these fantastically wealthy kingdoms, the Hoysalas, the Seone Yadavas, the Pandyas, the Kakatiyas. But before he can do that, of course, he has to break the power of the kingdoms of Rajasthan. These guys, the Rajput kingdoms, have extraordinary fortifications, some of them like, you know, spanning like entire systems of hills uh, with uh, with stockpiles for months, with, with running water within them, were easily able to outlast uh, Alauddin's forces. He hadn't really like figured out how to do siege warfare effectively by this point. And basically, his armies were all spread out quite thin, um, especially around the great fort of Chittor, when he received devastating news once again from the northwest. And as it turned out, the Mongols were out to avenge Kutluk Khwaja's death uh, and their defeat at the Battle of Kili in 1299. And the Mongols also seemed to be very aware that the Sultanate's forces were at this time dispersed, that Alauddin was involved in a very costly siege of Chittorgarh, and that other armies of the Sultanate were campaigning in Bengal. And so, once again, you have a force of about 12 Tumans, uh, about 120,000 men, rapidly making their way towards Delhi. Mm-hmm. Alauddin heard about this, 
and immediately had to rush back to Delhi, leaving Chittor alone. You know, sieges are very, very taxing on armies. The very act of camping en masse uh, creates a perfect environment for disease to spread. Uh, it saps morale. The environment itself can be very enervating for the energy of soldiers. And so this army of Alauddin Khilji had to head back through the deserts of Rajasthan to Delhi at great speed. And by the time they got to Delhi or the environs of Delhi, they were absolutely exhausted. Uh, this was not the army that had fought off the Mongols in 1299 at Kili. Uh, it was a much weaker force and it was desperately waiting for reinforcements to come in from the east. Alauddin at this point knew that he could not afford another pitched battle. The Mongols once again really needed to take Delhi as soon as possible. What Alauddin did this time actually, from what we understand, is very interesting. He seemed to have basically developed a very systematic and large-scale network of earthworks around the fortifications at Siri. Mm. These earthworks are basically meant to force any Mongol invader to channel their forces into fairly narrow tracks, mm. uh, which are easily defendable. And uh, in a sense, you know, this is not trench warfare in 1915 uh, in, on the Western front of Europe, but it is a, a, a weird form of siege where you have these two armies camped, you have uh, cavalry, infantry, even elephant cavalry protecting these strong points. And you have these earthworks basically limiting the movement of the Mongols. And the siege and standoff continued for another two months. There were skirmishes. We can imagine there were night raids and attacks. But eventually, the Mongols ran out of time. They ran out of fodder. And uh, the plains of India were heating up. And that was going to be terrible for the Mongol horses. And once again, the Mongols retreated. This was such a close-run thing. Kili was something that at least Alauddin was able to fight. At least he had the numbers on his side. At least he had his generals by his side. But this second campaign could so easily have ended in disaster. If Alauddin had arrived just a few weeks too late, if Alauddin had lost his nerve, if Alauddin had not understood the Mongols' weaknesses and understood that he basically had to buy time, it could have easily ended in disaster. But this guy stayed cool, stayed composed. He realized that the Mongols had an overwhelming numerical advantage, whereas he had the edge in terms of supplies. And so he figured out how to use defensive works in a way that negated the Mongols' advantage in numbers, sapped their morale, uh, stretched out their supply lines, and forced them eventually to come to terms with reality and retreat. And they should really like, make you consider who this Alauddin Kilji guy is. He's definitely not that that absolute uh, raving lunatic that he was portrayed as being uh, by Ranveer Singh and Padmavat. He is a cold, ruthless military and political leader on the lines of, I would say, perhaps even Raja Raja Chola himself. Um, there's a parallel that we'll see a little clearer in the next episode. So um, don't kill me yet. You will see that there's a parallel that actually makes sense. As an administrative reformer, as a military reformer, as an ambitious, um, if somewhat paranoid politician, Khilji should definitely rank among the most transformative figures in Indian history. But all that he's remembered for today is because of the 16th century story that was made up, which again we'll come to later, about his supposed infatuation with the Queen of Chittor. But once again, let's circle back to that day in 1302-1303, where Alauddin must have thanked God and thanked himself for this extraordinary situation that he had delivered Delhi from. All of a sudden, the most devastating threat to Delhi's existence had been defeated not once, but twice. Over the years to come, the Mongols would find themselves more and more occupied with events in Central Asia. And Alauddin, with this enormous professional army at his command, with some of the most remarkable military minds of their generation at his disposal, including Ulug Khan, and of course, a Gujarati eunuch, turned general called Malik Kafur would slowly turn his eyes on the rest of the subcontinent. It was time for Alauddin to fulfill the ambition that he had nurtured from his very earliest days as Sultan. It was time for him and Malik Kafur to conquer the rest of the subcontinent. If you like Yudha, please leave us a rating and review on your podcast app. Yudha is made possible by support from the Takshashila Institution and the Independent and Public Spirited Media Foundation. And your goodwill makes it possible for us to keep going.
If there's anything you'd like to learn about India's vibrant, violent military history, reach out to us on Twitter or Instagram. I'm Anirudh Kanesati. That's A N I R U D H K A N I S E T T I. And I'm Aditya Ramanathan. That's A D I T Y A R A M A N A T H A N. And while you're at it, don't forget to check out other interesting shows on the IBM Podcast Network. Advertising is dead. Yep, you heard me right. Advertising is dead. We're all in the content business now. Let's not call it news, TV, radio, etc., etc. It's all content, and we're in the middle of this weirdly exciting phase where all the borders and lines that have been drawn over decades has been swept away by this lovely thing called the internet. We're a show where we don't dwell on just the stuff that is now, but rather the wider stuff about advertising, media, content, and the whole goddamn circus surrounding it. Tune in every Tuesday for our weekly unboxing of the mystery box we used to call advertising. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch, and this is my new podcast, Advertising is Dead. Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli, Don Bradman, and now Cyrus Brocha. Okay, probably not in the right company. I mean, Don Bradman is Australian, but it's called Cyrus Says. A wonderful show about everything. Find the show on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts.